Kia ora. Welcome to Shared Lunch, brought to you by Sharesies with Business Desk. Now, Sharesies is a wealth development platform whose purpose is to create financial empowerment for everyone. My name is Francis Cook. I'm the investments editor at Business Desk. We have a special offer for Sharesies investors from Business Desk. If you use the promo code SHAREDLUNCH100, you'll get $100 off an annual subscription to Business Desk, which is usually $249, including GST. Now, the offer only applies to new business desk subscribers, can only be used once per subscriber, and can't be used with any other discounts. Before we get started, here's some important information. Investing involves risk. You might lose the money you start with. We recommend talking to a licensed financial advisor. We also recommend reading product disclosure documents before deciding to invest. Everything you're about to see and hear is current at the time of recording. Now, today we're joined by Jolie Hodson, CEO of Spark New Zealand Limited. Hi, Jolie. Hi there, Kia Tato, and good afternoon, everyone. Now, you have been with Spark for nine years. You became the CEO in 2019. How has the company changed in the time you've been there? Yeah, well, I joined back in 2013, and the change has been huge then. If you stand back and think about um, who we were as a company then, probably against our international peers, we were seen as a bit of a laggard. We weren't delivering our commitments as much, we were a bit slow with change. Um, and since that time, really around 2013, we started the whole program around reset of strategy, looking at our culture, the way we operated, what markets we wanted to be in. So we made a decision to come out of offshore markets and really invest in New Zealand to accelerate our mobile investments. And all of those things, when you put them together, have led to quite a big change in who the organisation is and how we operate. One of the proudest things, I think, around um, announcing our results yesterday was that when you look at us now against our international peers, we rank number two globally um, for total return to shareholders over a three-year CAGA, so at 12%. So it's a pretty good um, shift from where we were then to where we are now. Yeah, and we're going to dive into those numbers soon because there's A lot of really interesting stuff in there. Um, First of all, though, when you were coming into that CEO position, as an internal candidate, I think there's always quite a big difference when you come in internally or when you're an outsider. So you come in internally, you know the business. Did you immediately have a list of things you wanted to do differently? Well, I was already part of the leadership team and been quite involved in the strategy that we'd been progressing to that point. Obviously, when you come into... uh, CEO role at Lined pretty much in 2020 with a reset of the three years ahead. So for me, it was around the focus areas I wanted to lift up. So data and um, insights in the AI part of our business, I wanted to lift that. And that was one of those areas. Also, sustainability was an important thing to me, both what we were doing socially from a digital equity perspective, but also from an environment point of view. Um, And the new growth markets. So health has been one of those for us in IoT. So it's really around making sure when you're part of that team, and of course, strategy is not the CEO alone, it's the leadership team, it's the board. It's about us all leaning in to be able to deliver that. So my role is really about the choices and priorities within that. And that's where our that's where I sort of spent my time in terms of coming into that. So didn't rip up the sheet, start again. I've been part of that and part of making where we'd got to then, but had a sort of slightly different lens as we looked ahead. Yeah, you mentioned there, you know, the the focus on digital and things like AI. I mean, when it comes to new technologies and digital media, what is the New Zealand audience and customer like? Are we slow to embrace change or really keen on it? What are your thoughts on that? Look, I think we punch above our weight, really. When you look at us as as a country, we are prepared to try new things and we do um, bring different technologies together. There are some things that we will follow slightly, and there's some benefits on that in terms of the fact that you get to see how it operates in an offshore market. We make sure that we spend a lot of time talking to our peers in different countries because it gives us insights. And then you've got to apply it to how does that relate to New Zealand and um, the customers we have and and the businesses that we have. So in my view... There's some areas too that we lead. Wireless broadband is one of those. When you look at developed markets, we have one of the highest penetrations of um, wireless broadband versus other markets. So there's some things we lag on, some things we lead on. Interesting. And what are customers asking about at the moment or even just quite keen on in terms of new tech? What are the messages you're getting? I think one of the really exciting things I see with our business customers is 
technology is um, coming to a place where it can solve a lot of problems that they have been facing into for a period. So if you think about the convergence of technology, so that's bringing together things like your IoT sensors, um, the networks they run across, cloud computing, data and how you use the data and insight. We're seeing new use cases, so whether that's um, in, uh, so IoT, I'll give you an example. If you think about agriculture, using sensors to really understand what's the soil quality like, how's water through that, how can I make a more efficient crop? In transport and logistics, the efficiencies of running your um, fleet and understanding when they're last maintained and how you maintain those things together or bringing together um, for Ministry of Primary Industries. So we've just recently done some work with them around their fishing, inshore fishing vessels, putting cameras, um, using AI to look at the, the catches that are coming off to understand and inform their policies, research and uh, fishing events that occur. So you can see how quickly and how many different ways you can use it to solve problems. And I think that's the thing that's really exciting about the shift we're seeing here today. It's the ability to bring those things together to solve everyday problems for different businesses. One of the things I find is when we share that between different uh, enterprises, for example, they may not have the exactly same problem, but they can see how it could relate to their business and think about how they could use that. And then we can be alongside to help them um, put those pieces of the puzzle together. Interesting. Okay, let's dive into the numbers because I've teased them enough already. Your full year results came out just yesterday. You had a net profit of $410 million and that's up 7.6% over the previous year. So what's that down to? So if you stand back and look at it, our revenue grew by 2.8%. Um, so that was to $3.72 billion, driven uh, predominantly of strong growth in mobile, but also growth in some of those future markets I touched on. So the Internet of Things, uh, our digital health propositions. So that all led to a growing top line. We managed our cost base well again, the continuing programs that we've been doing. So that led to a, an EBIT die or an earnings growth there. And then our net profit, uh, sorry, our depreciation and, and amortization, our tax remained relatively stable. That led to the growth in the underlying net earnings that you saw of 410 million or, or two 410 million, sorry, was 7.6 percent growth. So really pleasing outcome in terms of we're in year two of our three year strategy. So the things we put in place around the capabilities we wanted to see in the growth markets we're focusing on have been contributing to that overall performance. Was there anything in there that you weren't happy with that pulled down that result for you? Look, when we look at our um, cloud security and service management, while it grew, it didn't grow as much as we our ambition was. So it was 0.7% growth across that. Within that cloud grew just under 2%. Um, when we look at that, that's partly to do with some of the interruptions we saw with COVID, some supply chain disruptions, also customer projects, slight delays around the ability to get on or off sites to be able to do that. We also had some things that we were doing around our own um, portfolio, so making sure that our plans were market fresh in terms of pricing, so relevance to customers. And we did some more work around our hybrid cloud offering. So when you stand back from cloud, um, it is a growing growing business and you can see demand coming on shore with more of the hyperscalers uh, building different data centres on shore. So volumes will continue to grow. And we can, from what we see, the research we see, hybrid cloud is the way customers will think about that and to just try and what is hybrid cloud it's really thinking around you think about your AWS or your Microsoft Azure they provide a public cloud service so very much um, uh, you go on to a platform that everyone can use private cloud is more around your own uh, operation so the combination of those two things brings together what we'd call a hybrid cloud and the ability to move across it enables companies to be able to move through using those services as it suits them. So we still will see growth in that area. We just had some challenges in this year that we needed to address and some product refresh that we were doing as well. Okay, and you also, in those um, numbers, you announced a $350 million share buyback and another $350 million to be invested back into Spark, growing that digital services arm and offsetting lease liability. So that to me, looks like a fairly clear 50-50 split between keeping shareholders happy and then growing the business for the future. Is that the logic? Yes, yeah, so if we stand back from it, the uh, capital returns you just referenced were in relation to the fact that we came to an agreement to sell 70% of our 
physical towers, so passive mobile assets. And really we came to that agreement on the basis that they no longer offered us a competitive advantage. So using third party investment to come in um, and to be able to, for us to recycle those funds to both return to, uh, to our shareholders, so 50% to our shareholders and then 50% to reinvestment in the in the growth areas. So we talked about that 5G acceleration, data centers, IoT and some of those new areas. So for us, it's around the right balance there. Yeah, it's interesting that you reference that because, yeah, the selling the, the mobile phone towers for $900 million, I mean, that's, that's certainly not chump change. Um, and you, of course, as you said there, I just want to be clear, you've decided to sell 70% of your interest in there. You do keep the, the yes. 30. Um, yes. And then you rent them back. And this is something that we've seen from other telcos overseas. It seems to be a, a sort of a growing trend. Was that, you know, did you see that happening overseas and think actually we could do that? Is this something that's been on the cards for a while? Why decide to do this? So we had looked about a year ago, we did a review of our assets and what what was strategic and we should retain, what would we consider selling or having a part ownership on as we looked here because we didn't see competitive advantage. So our towers were one of those. We did also look offshore and see what was happening in different markets. And for us, it's really that if they don't provide a competitive advantage, introducing that third party capital allows us to recycle capital to where it can be more effectively used and also return it to our shareholders so that's their intention. So when the transaction completes, because it hasn't completed yet, um, when it does complete, our intention is to return 350 million through an on-market uh, share buyback and and invest 350 million in those new areas of uh, digital infrastructure. And we are, of course, seeing more and more high tech requirements um, and high expectations from customers. You know, we we see quite high tech networks. Um, to support things like 5G. So is it one of those things where infrastructure maintenance becomes uh, quite difficult at that point? Look, every year we invest around $400 million a year in capital and infrastructure. So that's around investing in new networks. So the continued rollout of 5G is one of those examples. Another area is our, if you think about a highway down the island, so our fiber highway. So we invest in that as well. And we've been upgrading that to make more of that automated. So if there is a issue with that or a break, we can actually shift traffic. So as more and the more of the world goes online, uses digital more for different services, whether it's our industry or the banks or anyone else, we need to make sure it's as resilient as possible. Data is growing exponentially across that. So that means the capital we invest is really important. So we generally invest around that 400 million, which is really linked to about 10 to 11 percent of revenue is the guide we use. And there'll be different times that we may choose to invest further for greater growth or to accelerate growth. And some of those areas that we talked about, just touched on with that 350 million would also help us do that. Now, in that um, deal, which, as you said, it isn't finalized quite yet, but if it all goes ahead on um, selling 70 percent of the mobile phone towers, you would then have 15 years until you'd need to renegotiate renting those towers. Any worries about how that renegotiation might go? Look, we've entered into an agreement, a uh, long-term agreement, as you noted. We're very comfortable with the terms we have. We've retained a 30% stake, um, and that allows us to play a strategic role as the business progresses. And so when we think about those components, we don't have concerns about that renegotiation because also there's mutual interests within Taoco as well in terms of the ability to continue to invest and to build new sites. So we've made commitments around the sites that we will build. That's not all the sites we intend to do. So you have this opportunity also if you weren't getting the service or the things that you thought were appropriate, there are other Taocos to work with as well within um, New Zealand. But we've also chosen a long-term partner so what was really important to us in this uh, process was choosing a long-term partner that had good experience in managing infrastructure investments. So Ontario Teachers is the partner that we have. So they invest globally around $240 billion a year, or I have a, a $240 billion portfolio. And so they've got a really long-term focus and are very aligned in terms of the things that we want to do with this. So I think from my perspective, that was an important part of any choice we made to go into a, a long-term arrangement. Yes, you see some of those overseas pension funds and the 
assets that they have under management yes. are enormous, truly yes. huge. Um, yeah. <laughs> now, you also announced yesterday a new long-term dividend policy um, to have 80 to 100% of free cash flow paid out in dividends. So how much of a change is this policy for you? And, and do you think you've been paying out enough in dividends until now? Yeah, look, so we also, so we did announce a new policy and that really just sets a principle for which to consider how we think about dividends ahead. We also guide in a year to the year ahead. So in FY, um, for FY23, we've guided to a 27 cent dividend uh, fully imputed for next year. And that's a lift. It's the first time we've lifted the dividend since 2016. And that really talks to our confidence in the um, sustainability of the free cash flow and the earnings growth that we are creating as we look ahead. So that's the real shift you're seeing in terms of that policy. It's really more just laying that out, more the principles for which we'll apply um, that dividend policy. Okay. Now, there was some analysis released lately from uh, Venture Insights, which I thought was really interesting. And they were talking the um, telco market as a whole. And um, they identified some challenges, which I'd love your thoughts on and whether that applies to Spark as well. So Venture Insights said a slow economy, inflation and reduced immigration were problems for the telco market. What do you make of that? So I think certainly in terms of when you think about migration and closed borders over the last few years, what, what we haven't seen is the net migration in, which we did see prior to that. So when you think about um, new households, so either signing up to new plans or new broadband plans, we have had that missing for the last few years. Probably the biggest impact we've seen over the last couple of years actually is more around the loss of the roaming revenues because the borders were shut and there was no travelling. So we saw a small component return in FY22, but we are forecasting more for a 65% um, return to, to pre-COVID roaming levels in this year ahead. The other things we've seen from, you know, you know the ventures talked about in terms of uh, the higher inflationary environment, we, like every business, are subject to cost increases within that. So we're really focused on managing both uh, our own cost base, making sure that we're doing as much work as we can. We've had a long-term program around automation, ensuring that we're exiting legacy technologies, for example, that allows us to remove costs from within our business. We also offer um, plans and a range of brands to enable, mean that we can meet the needs of different customers. So if you think about if you really just want um, the lowest price but best um, quality service, but no uh, other value-added services attached, no uh, sport or music or anything with that. You know, we've got our skinny brands for that. Then also within our Spark brands, we've got the option of having a range of different services. So what we make sure that we do is through that through that perspective, we've got a resilient portfolio. And also when you think about how you live your life today, most people have a phone, they rely on the internet for a lot of things that they do. So what we've seen even probably more so in the last two to three years is a shift towards um, doing more and more online, which makes our category more resilient than perhaps some others are as well. So I think some of those venture insights absolutely apply to us. Probably the other thing that we've seen which has come through this type of environment is supply chain. So the mm. challenge in terms of the global supply chains, higher freight costs, but also the ability to get um, both stocks onshore. So we now carry 60 weeks of modems, for example, we used to carry 30 weeks of stock. And from a network equipment point of view, ensuring continuity of supply and the ability to roll out, so whether that's new mobile networks, we've carried more onshore. And you can see that a little bit in our working capital at the end of FY22 as a result of that. Yeah, well, interesting you mentioned that because, you know, the flip side of what Venture Insights identified, they also you know, looked at some growth opportunities that they said looked really good. So they were saying new technology was was very much the key for the telco sector, things like 5, 5G, progressing the rollout of ultra-fast broadband and the increasing adoption of fixed wireless were growth opportunities. Yeah. Now, are those the growth opportunities that you're also eyeing up? Is there anything else that's a little different for you? So they're all absolutely factors in terms of our business and how, how we're performing. So there are opportunities as more and more goes online and obviously we provide the services. Wireless broadband, our penetration or market penetration is 28% of our base is on wireless broadband now and that would be leading when you look worldwide at that. Um, I think you touched on, what was the other thing you just touched on? Uh Sorry, was it fixed wireless or ultra-fast broadband? Uh, yeah, the fixed wireless, yes, I know. We've got that. But also if you think about our other services ahead, 
Um, uh, so Internet of Things is definitely a component that is growing. And when we look at it, a lot of that is also to do with sustainability. So half of our revenues would for IoT would be in relation to the Internet of Things, and that's the sensors, whether water or energy. Uh, we also seeing the cloud growth we talked about as well, uh, and the convergence of the technology. So there's lots of opportunity. 5G rollout, so we accelerated that through 22. We were a little bit impacted by COVID lockdowns, especially for a few months, but we've um, managed to catch that up and we're moving forward in terms of this year ahead. So all of those things are about creating greater um, capacity and connectivity for the country so others can innovate on top of this. Because the reality for us, it's about provide, we're an enabling company. That's really how we generate um, our income and grow. And it's really around helping whether it's our consumers or our business customers to really do the things they need to, to run their business. And in a higher inflation environment, the ability to offer ways of solving problems, so make it more effective or efficient using technology, is something that we can do and play a strong role in uh, for Aotearoa. And also innovation, like how do we find new ways of doing things with converging technologies? And we've done a lot of work just trying to make sure that we're sharing more of the use cases, the real life stories that you can see around, so people can sort of think, how does that relate to me or my business and how could I um, replicate that in my business? Yeah, let's talk about sport briefly, because I see we've already got um, a question come through on it. And I think it's really important because the last couple of years have been tough for sport in general, but particularly streaming sport. I think it got knocked a lot more than many people expected. So Spark Sport, how important is streaming sport to the company now? And is that sector of the company performing to the level you want it to be? Yes, yeah, so Spark's an important part, sport is a part of our entertainment portfolio. So when you think about that, um, we offer a number of different services, whether that's general entertainment, so your Netflixes or your Neon or, or music, Spotify. Sport plays a role within that, so that's important. Uh, you think about what's happened over the last few years, uh, and COVID has interrupted the sporting schedules. There is no doubt a number of key, so that makes that challenging to manage too across uh but what we've focused on is making sure when we have the content and we've got that running, that, that we do a great job with that. So cricket's been a great example of that for us. And we've seen growth in terms of what we're doing there, uh, both a subscriber basis. We talked uh, at the half year around focusing on strategic partnerships to increase access to content distribution. So we're still progressing that. I don't have anything more to say about that right now, but that's around looking to continue to improve the commercial returns there as well. Right, okay. So does that basically, because we've had this question here in the comments already from Liz saying, how does Spark Sport fit with the future direction of Spark as an entity? So is that basically the future that you're looking at? So I think when you think about where does it fit, it fits in that entertainment portfolio. It's a, it's a service we offer so customers can choose that as a evaluated service, just in the same way they do some of our other entertainment propositions. And then for us, it's about finding those partnerships and ways in which we get it um, an appropriate commercial return for that business. Mm. Okay. Um, now, you did recently have a bit of bad news where you had to refund 113,000 customers for a wire maintenance service. Um, now, that had cost about $15.7 So talk to me about how that situation went wrong and also what mm -hmm. you make of the Commerce Commission's investigation that led to this result. Are you happy with the result at the end of this? So... Just to, for a bit of context, the wire and maintenance fee uh, related to copper wiring within when your house. So when you think about, you may recall when fibre first came in, um, fibre was bundled with copper voice lines. So mm. copper services, the wire and maintenance service was still appropriate at that time. But as time's gone by and, and landlines have fallen away and we went back to have a look and say, did we see customers getting as much benefit as they should have? And we made the decision to refund our customers on a fibre service all the way back to the inception of that service. And so we recorded that and called that out in our 2021 account. So you won't have seen anything in relation to it in FI22 because we provided for that, but we also um, refunded our customers. That's obviously not the standard that we would expect, you know, product standard for our customers. And we've apologised to those that were that impacted. So all of that refunds uh, occurred really over the back end of 2021. And um, and so 100% of our existing customers have been refunded and 95% of former, and that's really around just being able to contact the former 
our customers to get that last part complete. So the Commerce um, Commission announcement more recently uh, really just brought that to a close because we'd done all of the refund work, et cetera, a year ago. Right, and you have had a few other brushes with the Fair Trading Act. I mean, just to quickly run through, 2019, Spark was prosecuted and fined 675000 for um, what was called misleading customer invoicing. There was a warning in 2019 for a broadband price increase and a warning in 2017 for misleading advertising. I mean, obviously you're a big company, but um, is there a need for changes to stop these issues cropping up? So if you think about um, the telecom mobile, it was quite a complex business with a lot of legacy products and services. Mm -hmm. And that complexity can lead to error within that. That's not to um, underscore or, or say that that's acceptable, but that's why you'll see in our three-year strategy that we've had in place a big focus on simplification of our products and services, because that means it's better for our customers in terms of making sure there aren't these opportunities for issues to occur and it's a more efficient and effective way for our business. So we've been doing a lot of work over the last um, two years, particularly to make sure that we remove these things from our business. And you'll see in our latest results, we uh, retired 102 mobile and broadband plans, and we also migrated 350,000 customers onto new plans. And that's all about making sure they're on the uh, best plans and most modern, and we've, we remove some of these older issues that have existed, and that's, a big focus ahead. We haven't finished yet, and we certainly uh, don't think that that's acceptable from a customer perspective, and certainly we have apologised where those things have happened, and we're making sure we're putting in place the process and the focus to ensure that it doesn't happen to the future. How frustrating is it for you as CEO when these issues crop up and hit the headlines and undermine the rest of the work you're doing? Look, at the end of the day, we've got to take responsibility for everything that happens within the organisation. And so my biggest focus on is what happened, why did it happen, and how do we move forward to ensure it doesn't happen in the future? And that's about making sure we put the right resources um, against that. The work I said around simplification, for example, is, is one of those elements in how we ensure that we we do the have the right things in place to ensure it doesn't happen in the future. It can be, you know, disappointing for our people as well who work hard to make sure that they deliver for customers every day. But at the end of the day, you've got to face into the things that have occurred and make sure that you make it right. Mm. Now, I would remind those who are listening in to this at the moment that we've got a couple of questions already, but there's actually not that many. So if you are wanting to ask a question here, it is your time. Um, Spark is a, a big company and we don't often get these opportunities to ask the questions directly. So drop those into the ask a question section and also upvote so that I know which ones you guys are most interested in. But until then, one more from me. I mean, if you're looking ahead for the, the next 12 months, um, what are you gazing into your crystal ball, what are you thinking might be a high point and a low point for Spark in the year ahead? Look, for me, the, the high points ahead is really closing out on our three-year strategy, delivering on the ambitions that we uh, promised to the market. We'll obviously have the return of capital through that time, so shareholders will um, uh, get the benefit of that. But it's really around making sure we're putting in place the foundations that enables our business to take that next step of growth. And so that's what I'm really excited about when I think about the year ahead. Yeah. What about a low point? Well, I don't have a low point for the year ahead. Maybe the low point for the year just uh, been probably... You know, we talked about it a little bit at the start in terms of the different impacts on working environments and how we've experienced sort of lockdowns. I think for me through that first six months, particularly I'm based in Auckland, um, the inability to be out, see customers, be able to work with different teams, see my teams in person, I think has a, a, has a personal impact. I much prefer that ability to have that, that uh, interaction, have conversations. Now, we all know why we had to do that and the health reasons that sit around that, but in terms of a way of working, I like the mixture of being able to be out and about um, and seeing people and seeing what's happening in the different businesses around us. I know, I think it's that the last year or so, New Zealanders um, were very lucky to avoid a lot of the COVID disruptions. And the last year or so, we really had it hit us full force, didn't we? Um, all right, let's jump into some of these questions from the audience. Um, 
here's one um, from Zestin. When is this year's Spark AGM? Does this take place on the same day or place annually? How does it get communicated? And are we able to attend this, uh, whether it's in person or via tech? So the Spark AGM is in November. So that's in the first week. It's about, it's always in that sort of first week in November. So we have, um, we will be attending in person this year as well as virtual. So people have the choice in terms of how they would like to attend the meeting. Uh, for that. Mm. Yeah. Excellent. Um, all right. And how important is cybersecurity to Spark? Given all the spam and uh, attacks New Zealand has experienced to date, thinking about the attack on our banks. Of course, we also saw um, the NZX have an attack. So, yeah, what do you make of that? Yeah. So we have a significant significant cybersecurity team, over 140 cybersecurity experts, which not only protect our networks and networks into New Zealand, but also protect our customers um, and work with our customers. So I think it's one of those things, cybersecurity is something you can never stand still in. You've constantly got to be um, looking at the threat landscape. The cybersecurity teams are hugely connected, so both offshore, because often things happen overseas first and then come towards New Zealand. It's um, constant awareness. So whether it's you individually, people in your business, being aware of what you're opening, if there are things on emails, thinking about how you keep, how you use passwords. Uh, repeating passwords across sites and other things is one of the easiest ways for people to, to get hacked. So when you think about cybersecurity, we have a role to play, significant role in protecting networks, but also in, in terms of our business customers as well, particularly we have a number of those to protect their environments. Um, and it's, so it's a constant learning uh, developing, addressing those issues as they arise. Mm. All right. Now, I love this question from Brendan, a nice technical one for us. Can you share why Spark chose a share buyback versus higher dividends? So when we look at our, we'd, well, I suppose put into the two parts, we had a, we've increased our ordinary dividend and that's off the back of growing um, uh, earnings and free cash flow. In terms of the intended capital return off the 70% sale of Talco, that we really looked at what was the most effective for all shareholders and um, the on-market buyback was the most effective way of returning that. That's obviously subject to market conditions at the time. So first the transaction has to complete and then we have to move towards that. We will continue to assess those market conditions and if we didn't think that they, that was appropriate, then we'd also look at other forms of capital return. Mm. Now going a completely different vibe here. Um, quite interesting still though what sort of phone do you have as a CEO of Spark and are you a tech nerd? I have an iPhone you can see it here um, uh, I do enjoy, I use a lot of uh, digital services and so forth I'm not sure I'd categorize myself as right up there in the tech nerd um, component but I do like the the benefits that it delivers and I think as I've talked about, I like the mix too, though, of it's a bit like digital versus physical. There's things that work really well online and excellent to do there. There are also things that work really well in person. So I have the mixture of those things. Um, and obviously, the industry I work in, you get exposed to a lot of different different elements. So it's always interesting to keep learning. And one of the things I love about my job is the ability to keep learning. I'm never, uh, never want for a challenge or an opportunity to think about. And that's such a great part of being part of this organization. And and we also lean in because we enable so many other customers. I get to see so many different um, industries, sectors, the opportunities, the challenges they face. So it's a really good chance to think about how technology can then solve problems for our, for our customers and help New Zealand move forward in that regard. And I feel like with the people that you must work with, you're probably quite unlikely to call yourself a tech nerd because you probably work with some yes. uber tech <laughs> nerds that <laughs> totally change your definition of normal. Yes. <laughs> yes, especially when you think about some of our deep specialists in um, data and AI or whether you're thinking around some of our deep cyber people. Um, but the beauty of that is bringing that all together in a way that we can serve our customers well. And that's, you know, that's the part I love about leading this organisation. Uh, it's the opportunity to do that and to make a difference in, in the country that we that we operate in. So. Yeah. Now, there's another question here from Mark, which has got a lot of upvotes. Um, so obviously, people are very interested in this. Are you experiencing challenges with finding skills in the market? How do you see remote working um, being adopted by New Zealand as a whole longer term? So two questions in one. Go for it. Yes. 
So the first one around, are we seeing um, labour scarcity? Absolutely we are. And particularly in certain areas, uh, so whether I talked about data AI, there's some of those areas. So for us, we're thinking about it in a number of different ways. Um, one, uh, how do we upskill some of our own people into some of these areas? We've got opportunity for what I call the lived experience side of learning. We also have a chance to put people on some more of the micro-credential courses. So, you, so it gives them that chance to, to fill those different gaps. And it's a great way of bringing people through your organisation. They already know your business. It's moving them into a new area. We're also working with different entities, so universities and others, to think about the type of skills we need into the future. Because not only are we seeing a shortage that's existing globally at the moment, but in our particular industry, that has been there for a while. And as digital mm -hmm. transformation continues to happen, it's only going to get, get worse. And in our very um, mobile world, generally, people's ability to move around again, um, that becomes challenging both from a net immigration out uh, and those skills going offshore and then making sure that we can attract people in here. So we're sort of thinking about it in a range of different ways. How do we continue to grow our own talent? Who do we work with to make sure the pipelines are, are going well? And how do we think about it a bit differently across even other corporates in terms of sharing some of those um, different skills? And then, sorry, the second part was our hybrid way of working. So I definitely think um, when you think about a workplace, it has changed substantially in the last few years. That's a little bit to do with what people have got used to as we've worked outside it, but also I think a reconsideration of what working looks like um, and what's the environment I want to be in. And we absolutely support flexibility. So there's sometimes it'll be great to be together. There are other times that working remotely works well. I've also got to remember across 5,000 people I have some teams that in the the only way of working is in the office, but to keep you in a retail store, some of our critical infrastructure, there is no other way of working. So it is about making sure the environment's set up for everyone, but I don't see a return back to where it was two years ago. I think it probably continues to evolve as people um, find the ways that work with them. Sometimes people might have gone completely remote and found that actually there's elements of being together that I still like, so how do I find that mix? And so I think it's really around um, workplaces and leaders and, and employers really thinking around how, what's the critical talent I want in my business? How do I track them? But also, how am I delivering for my customers? Because ultimately, you know, we're in business to serve our customers as well. So we've got to make sure it works not only for the individual, but the team that they work with or the squad and, and our customers as well. So it's finding the sort of sweet spot within all of that. <laughs> And we're talking a lot to our people too about how they see that forward, certainly from a cultural point of view and what's important to them. Mm. All right, we're going to squeeze in one last, we'll have to keep the answer to this somewhat quick, but um, one last question from Sam. With the border reopening, more international visitors will come to New Zealand. Will this bring more revenue to Spark as the tourism market comes back to normal? If yes, do you have an estimate um, on how much that could contribute to revenue in terms of dollars or a percentage or whatever works? Yeah, so if you think about the biggest um, driver of that for us will be both inbound and outbound, it's roaming revenues. So we completely lost those over the last two years. We've got a little bit back in the last few months of, of this financial year, but as we look towards 23, we're expecting them to return to about 65% of our pre-COVID levels. If you roll back to what, 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 how much was that? I hear you asking me the question. So that was a roughly around sort of 50 odd million of revenue around then. So if you think, we're not sure that all of it comes back. It'll be interesting to see how with different um, airline availability, all those sorts of things will have an impact. We're only really one month into this new um, era with borders open to most countries. So far it's tracking around that 65%, but we'll continue to monitor it. That's probably the biggest effect. Obviously if we saw, as I touched on earlier, a big net migration into New Zealand, then that creates new households um, and it creates new opportunities for both broadband connections, but also mobile and other services. So that would be the other way that we would see um, an opportunity there. But it's a bit early to tell what that's going to look like in that sort of first year or two. Mm, it will be really interesting to see how that all shakes out, won't it? All right, well, mm. that is everything we have time for. Thank you so much for tuning in, everyone, and sending great questions. Apologies that I couldn't get to all of them, but the ones that we got to were just great. Um, and of course, a big thank you to Jolie for joining us. We do really appreciate your time and your insights. 
Thank you, Francis, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in. All right, everyone, next week we will be discussing a topic that lots of you have an interest in. You guessed it, property. We'll chat to independent economist Tony Alexander about all manner of things, including the dip in prices, rising interest rates, and the future of what was once the Kiwi dream. Now, a link to register for that discussion is in the chat right now. Until next time, enjoy the rest of your week. Do stay safe. Thank you.